I remember the moment of seeing it coming into the window, this huge thing. Uh, and that was my first instrument. And my dad kind of uh, showed me how to get around it at the beginning. But I, I was four, four years old. All right. OK, so 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 when you when you took up drums a bit later, that was, you know, the piano had definitely come first. I mean, it would it would make yeah. sense uh, given given what was to come. Um, but I was interested in reading that you took up took up drums kind of after that. And obviously, you know, the kind of the percussive side um, to your playing, you know, um, some people have said that that, that had an effect. Um, is that something that you would that you would kind of consider? Um, yeah, be... yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, when when uh, when I was first listening to those recordings that my dad had, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker and the Billy Eckstein big band, uh, Art Blakey playing drums, uh, the the uh, the rhythm and the drummers were attractive to me. That that I I loved that. And when I would go to gigs uh, that my dad would take me to, I was always interested in the in the drums. So. I guess it was uh, it wasn't until I was about uh, 11 years old that that my dad uh, got me a little set of drums, and I I set them up down in my my little room down in the basement, and um, at that time it was you know stereo speakers, and and a turntable, and I put on these uh, I put on these big band records. Um, Dizzy Gillespie, Dizzy Gillespie's big band, uh, you know Ray Charles' big band. Uh, and and put on these records, play them through these speakers. I'd put right behind me, and I'd be sitting at the drums, and I'd play to the, I'd play to the songs, and uh, I used to have a ball doing that. That does sound like a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so, in terms of your your learning of piano, um, you know your 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 legacy is certainly um, as being one of the greatest players of all time for sure, and and so you you know a lot of people speculate about the the 10,000 hour rule um would What's you say that? You, you, well that if you if you spend 10,000 hours on something you can become a master um so uh, first of all do you think that that's true and secondly if so wh when did you get your 10,000 hours in you know how old do you oh, I see. <laughs> no i i think uh, i i think uh, once a person starts out on a on a skill if he if if the runway is that long, he'd never make it to ten thousand hours, unless he know unless he knew that something was going on. It had never happened. But the ten thousand hours idea works in the sense that when you do get passionate about something and you're 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 winning at it and you're doing well and you like it, like like well, like me playing the piano, uh, just kept doing it. Then of course the hours build up because that's what you want to do. And and that is the that is the factor, that uh, uh, that is one of the main factors that I think uh, creates um, uh, great skill and great competence. Is just you keep at it, and you keep improving, you keep at it, you keep improving. And you know the musicians that I play with, pretty much as myself, uh, spend their lives doing it. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's it's definitely a calling. I think when, once you get to the highest level, because there's probably no way of keeping up your chops um, to that to that extent, other than putting the time in. You know, uh, beyond the beyond the obvious talent. Um, so, when when you were first learning piano, did you did you learn uh, by reading, um, or did you learn by exploring it by yourself? Uh, you know, I've learned mostly, and I believe every skilled artist and every skilled anybody learns most of what their basic skill is by doing it. Uh, of course, you have uh, uh, someone who shows you, you have books, you have whatever the theory is, but, but the, actual, the actual result of all of that input is going to be always measured by how well you do it, you know. So uh, um, my first uh, my first explorations was pretty much on my own at the piano, but my dad uh, proved to be a great example as a um, as a teacher because he was a very non-critical 
uh, encouraging kind of a teacher. Like he didn't, he didn't say, oh, you're doing that wrong. You should do that better kind of thing. You know what I mean? It, it, was, more, it was more like encouraging me. Uh, uh, when he saw me do something well, he encouraged me. And then he tried to show me things that he thought would help. Like he showed me how to read music. Uh, he showed me the simplest way to read music that I can think of, which is you sit at a piano and you, you got a very simple piece of music notation there. And you know, there are these black dots on lines and spaces. That, that's kind of the, the, the basic format. So he, he'd play a note on the piano, boom, and then he'd point to the black dot that represented that note. And he'd say, that's a D. And then he'd go, dum, dum. And he'd point to the next black dot and he said, that's a G. And then you figure out how the, how the pitches fit on the lines and spaces and pretty soon you're reading music. Which yeah, became, well, which became a, a, a very useful tool to me because my main passion is as a composer. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and, you know, but when you started developing these skills, you know, how long was it uh, between then and, and your, your first, your first gigs? Um, Cause you were, you were already playing gigs by high school, right? Yeah, even before that, um, even before that, you know, my dad uh, purchased this um, uh, uh, disc cutter. It's actually, it was actually like a commercial form of a, of a uh, LP lathe and, and with, a, with a microphone that you uh, played into and you cut a record. You know, you, you, it's like instead of putting music on your uh, iPhone mem memory, memo, memo pad or uh, turning on a, t a, a tape recorder or a digital sequencer, there was this lathe but basically a lathe that you take a, a, a piece of fresh vinyl with no tracks on it, you put the lathe on it and then you record. So that was my first gig was when I was like five, I think five or six is my dad recorded several pieces that, that I played on the, on the piano. Wow. That's amazing. So do you still have, do you still have that? I, I do. And, and as a matter of fact, there's a recording called, uh, <clears throat> Beyond Forever that was put out many years ago that one of the tracks on it is a little chicky. That's really cool. I bet that, you know, that's uh, that's probably a, a priceless collector's item or something like that, you know. Uh, uh, that original. Yeah, it's, pretty, oh. it's cute, me with my, my little voice. And I did two takes. My, uh, my <clears throat> the first take I played the song. Then on the second take, I, I, I my dad let me s announce it and I said, okay, now I'm going to play it my way. So then I put it a second take and I did it more loose my way. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so what was, what was the point at which you thought, um, you know, I, I want to pursue music for the rest of my life professionally. Can, you can know, you I, I've been asked that question and, and I've, I've looked at it honestly many times and, and the same answer comes up, uh, which is I've never made that decision <laughs> because it always seemed to just be a given to me. Like, yeah. like for, for instance, uh, uh, when I was around that age, five, six, seven years old, my dad had a band and after he would do his local gig, uh, his, his musician friends would come back to our apartment up on the third floor and my, like after their gig and my mother would, uh, Anna would cook, uh, uh, pasta and food for them and they'd all sit around the table and I'd always get up, uh, out of bed and come in and hang with them in the kitchen and they, they loosened their ties and they were smoking cigarettes and having a jolly old time and I thought, this is my group. <laughs> And, you know, I want to. I want to be like them. Yeah, well, I, I can see why you would. And uh, I mean, I, I I do like that element um, to it that that it wasn't a kind of thing. It, you know, it doesn't feel forced in any way. It just really seems like it's been a totally natural life for you. Um, well, I want to make one one point about that uh, uh, because it's an important point, which is. Uh, you know, uh, I've, I've uh, experienced enough now to see 
that there uh, there are different kind people are different, mm -hmm. and so therefore therefore very different. So therefore there are a lot of different kind of parents and parenting. And uh, my, pa I always thought everyone had parents like mine who were very encouraging, who let me have my own mind. They let me, they let me explore when I wanted to explore. Uh, often they let me stay out late when I was a young because I was hanging with musicians. And they generally encouraged me in the direction of making music uh, very kindly, in a kindly, warm-hearted way and never, never stopped me. And I, I attribute that a lot to the to the fact that I uh, I didn't feel any uh, any pressures about who I was or what I was trying to do. I felt felt very confident in myself as I was growing up. But yeah, that, that that's a, an interesting and, and important point. Um, I think if people don't have the right support system around them, particularly with regards to creative arts, um, it can be difficult for them to feel free enough to pursue them. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting point. So um, one, of, one of the kind of, um, among many iconic things that you've done, of course, um, early on in your career, you were part of Miles Davis's band. Um, and, uh, you know, how, how do you um, look back on that time now? Um, is, is, this, is, is this a part of your life that you remember extremely fondly? Um, and if so, what, what are some of your best memories from that period? Well, uh, that, uh, that period of the um, 60s, I, got, I, I left high school in 59 and uh, immediately moved to New York City from Boston. And, and uh, that period of the 60s and the 70s, I joined Miles' band in, in 1968 after I had had a lot of experience in and around New York with a lot of different bands. And uh, that whole period for me is, you know, that's my era, basically. <laughs> the 60s and the 70s, I'm, I, that's where I'm from. I'm from the 60s. I'm, I'm from the past, uh, sort of, go, going into the future. I bring all that experience with me. And Miles, working with Miles was kind of a, uh, a culmination of my uh, university training as far as apprenticeships go uh, because uh, I had followed Miles and his music on recording since his first record his first re published recording was in 1951 and uh, I was let's see 1951 yeah I believe 90 but I, I was 10 years old and and I, and I was already listening to his records and I and I followed he him and his bands and his the various iterations of his his bands and his musicians all the way up from fifty one, all the way up through his famous um, uh, his famous recording with the with the sextet uh, 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 kind of blue in nineteen fifty nine, and then and then uh, I was in New York. Or, or in fact, that's when I graduated high school. Is nineteen fifty nine, and I saw that band. That, that kind of blue band play in Boston at the old Storyville uh, Jazz Club. And I was sitting right in front of Miles. It was Miles, Bill Evans on piano, Paul Chambers, uh, uh, Jimmy Cobb uh, and, on drums, and, and uh, John Coltrane on saxophone, and Cannonball Adderley on, on alto. I mean, whoo, wow. So, um, so from that point on, I followed everything Miles did. And uh, in 1968, uh, I got a call to join his band and I was with him for two and a half years and it was a glorious time for me. And, and a lot of people point to this, this sort of the birth of, of jazz fusion. Um, and is, is, that, is that something that you would, that you would attribute um, to, to that kind of lineup and that, and that, that, that period? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole of the '60s, uh, and especially breaking out uh, in in and around Miles and Coltrane, were experimentation. It was experimentation with forms. That's where that that commercial word fusion comes from, because because in actual fact, if you wanted to get real nerdy about it, uh, you you could say that any music is a fusion. 
you could take Bach's music and show how it's a fusion of, of elements, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he learned from this guy, he learned from that guy, and he put that together and it became Bach's music. So, so uh, but in the 60s and the, and the uh, sev early 70s, there was, a, there was an, a special amount of experimentation with, with forms of music and uh, putting, putting uh, uh, like rock music be started to become, rock and funk and music started to become more of a, com uh, more of a public commercial success. And, and the jazz musicians learned from that, as well as, as, well as you know, the other element in New York, cultural element in New York was the Latino music, which was also very strong in the 60s. Eddie, Eddie Palmieri and Tito Puente and uh, Machito's big band. And as a matter of fact, on, on Broadway uh, in New York City, uh, the, the old famous Birdland, where I, where I worked with Miles and many other uh, uh, bands, was just several doors down from from the Palladium, which was a dance hall where all the Latino bands worked. So, so the Latino musicians and the jazz musicians would go into each other's club to hear each other play. I mean, that was a real fusion. That was like what came out of that was a, was was like uh, stayed with me my my whole life. That combination of uh, of uh, Afro-Cuban, African. Uh, 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 rhythms, uh, flamenco rhythms, tango rhythms, together with uh, with uh, with uh, real blues and jazz rhythms from Duke Ellington and and Louis Armstrong. All that fusion together is, you know. But but then when the rock music became popular, all all that happened is that some of the jazz musicians, including Miles, took the idea of a steady beat. You know, the beat changed. That's the main thing that changed. Like like uh, the the Miles Davis quintet that I first joined was a similar rhythm with Tony Williams. Tony Williams it was a similar rhythm to his earlier bands, which was a very loose jazz rhythm, and very very intricate and subtle and and uh, uh, virtuosic and so forth. You know, but Miles I think recognized that that if you if you if you made the beat real solid, people would more easily go in rapport. With the music, and and so he brought together a lot of elements in in Bitches Brew, and that was in uh, 1969, uh, and uh, I think that really opened up uh, what what later got called fusion jazz or jazz rock or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a very good point um, that music, uh, you know, all, all music is essentially fusion in that. You know, there's not, there's not, there's not some kind of, there's not one singular artist that's classical or pop or or whatever. There's not just one, and then any deviation, you know, any other artist would therefore be a deviation from that um, if it was so. So, you know, it kind of, it couldn't work that, that anybody could be confined particularly to, to one genre. One more point on that, which is that that's the human condition because we're the human race and we communicate with one another. We don't live alone. Like, like you can't develop an art form alone in the woods somewhere. We could, theoretically, but you don't. You, 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 we, we, we're a social uh, race. <laughs> Hopefully we're a social race. And, and we, like, we like to communicate with one another and entertain one another and we learn from one another. So is that it's constant fusion of, of elements. No one, no one grows up alone as an artist. That, that something that you mentioned on communication um, kind of leads me to this, to this question. Um, it wasn't going to be my next question, but um, I'm kind of curious to ask, ask about this. Um, one, one of the things that I read um, is that, and, and you can never tell sometimes with the information that you, that you take from the internet is going to be, 100% accurate. So of course, it's always better to ask the, the, the proper source. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I read that um, communication uh, was something that you read about um, and kind of got inspired, inspired about um, with the book by um, Ron Hubbard, um, like di Dianetics. Is, is, is that the case? And would you, and would you recommend that book? Because I was considering ordering it after I learned, learned this. So I, 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 love, I love to read. <laughs> Well, well, as a as a philosopher and and someone who 
who uh, experienced life and told a life story in a way that others could gain uh, uh, increased ability from, L. Ron Hubbard is at the top of the scale. So when I, when I came across that book, Dianetics, uh, the way he presented uh, what life is about, being a spiritual being, having a body, uh, communicating uh, uh, in order to survive, uh, and, and all of these very basic principles, one of the things that clicked with me was the fact that, uh, that music wasn't just a mechanical activity of me playing the piano. Like, like uh, uh, really, really, in essence, what it was, was me communicating with, who, with whoever, with my, mu with my musician friends, or with the people in the room, or later on with a little club engagement, or whoever the audience was that's listening, that the act of art, the act of it, the activity of art, is one of communication. And so that that was a, that was a factor that uh, I hadn't studied or considered that much. I figured, well, I'm just the way I am, and, and uh, I, I usually play like this, and, you know, and, uh, but then I started looking out and discovering that there were other artists who were communicating amazingly, like one of my, um, one of my favorite all-time artists is Stevie Wonder. Uh, we became we became uh, friends in the early '70s when he was first doing his uh, amazing set of recordings, and he used to come by and hear "Return to Forever," my band, and I would look at him as an artist and see how how you know as a singer as a songwriter how his message and was how what a what what a positive effect he was creating on his audiences, and then I thought. Well, you know, that's what all music does. And let me see how I can, now that I understand that, uh, let me see how I can take the ideas that I love, the music that I love, and deliver them in a way to others that can be received so that they can understand what I'm doing or, or get, get pleasure from it. In other words, I, I started to become curious about how I could get my communication across because because it doesn't it never feels good to just communicate uh, to someone or something and then they don't understand what you what you're doing so who who's whose responsibility is that mine or theirs well it's a little bit of both right but <laughs> but uh, but I take it on as as uh, I take it on my plate as my responsibility so my my performances and everything that I do is a constant study in, in communication. It's like, like uh, all of the things that I love to do, how do I gather them and form them and put them in a way that I can deliver a package that will, that will make others happier or give them pleasure? Because that's how, that's how I like to be treated when an artist uh, uh, plays for me. You know, they, I get inspired by an artist. I go, wow, look what that's done for my life, you know. Yeah, and so was that, was that book a kind of turning point in, in terms of you considering that, that side to it, the side of communicating with an audience? Say, say that again, uh, I didn't get it. So was reading that book um, yeah. sort of um, a turning a point? Kick, yeah, it was a turning point. It was a kickoff for me to start to investigate that side of that spiritual side of life. And one of your seminal um, live recordings, um, well, in my opinion, anyway, was uh, was uh, you know the Paris concert recording um, with, with Circle, um, and, uh, and and I guess that would have only been a few years after you read this book, maybe, or around the same time. Yeah, it was around that time. Yeah, and was and, and Circle came came after your time in Miles Davis's band, right? That's right. Immediately afterwards. Um, and so how, how come Circle was quite short-lived as, as a project? Well, it, it was, uh, 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 my, my interests were, were changing very quickly. Uh, I was in Miles' band right toward the end of that, that three years. Uh, I had developed a really beautiful rapport with Dave Holland, the, the bassist. And we loved, we loved the free I was taking at that time with Jack DeJanet on the drums and uh, Wayne Shorter on the saxophone. And the, uh, if, you, if you listen to some of the, 
some of the published live concerts we've done, you can see how wild and loose that band was. Uh, we, we, were, we would define gravity. Uh, we, would, we were playing things backwards. We were doing all kinds of different things. And, and, and at a certain point, we could see that Miles, Miles really wanted to put a steady beat back into the music, to ground it. And, uh, and when we went into, when we all went into the studio in 1969 uh, to do Bitches Brew, he definitely put the music into a vamp style uh, with, with a backbeat. And, and, uh, you, that, and even though the, the music that was flowing on top of that was very mellifluous and creative and, and changing, that backbeat kept everything together. And Dave and I, at that point, we wanted to, to um, uh, continue to explore just free playing without, without a particular backbeat or without a whatever. So, so we went into circle, but soon after a year and a half or so into circle, I started wanting to, to make melodies and to, to put, put grooving rhythms back into, into my music. So therefore, some kind of my, my engagement with circle sort of, sort of ended and that's when I formed Return to Forever. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, Return to Forever um, was such a, a high point and such a beloved part of your, your career. Um, and, uh, and as, you know, especially uh, records like Light as a Feather or, you know, the, the self-titled um, Return, for, Return to Forever album. You know, these are, these are such wonderful albums. Um, what was the process like for making these albums? Um, wh where were these recorded and, and um, you know, uh, you were really on quite a roll at this point, like both of those albums were made, made the same year, weren't they? Uh, yeah, the, those were the first two. That, 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 uh, re the Return to Forever band was actually in, in s several iterations, but three major uh, uh, bands made up Return to Forever. The first, those two records that you're talking about is from the first band with Ayerto Moreira on drums and uh, Flora Purim singing and Joe Farrell playing saxophone and flute with uh, Stanley Clark. So uh, and that first band made those first two records. Uh, uh, Light as a Feather, by the way, was recorded in London. That, wow. uh, we, yeah, we were on, we were on tour at the time. We rented. We I remember we we had to rent all the equipment, the, the Fender Rhodes and the and the Fender Twin amplifier, and because uh, because we were we were touring the world at that time. But from 1972 or so till about 1975 or 76 was a very intense uh, active period for. The first that band, and then in 1973, uh, when Ayrton and Flora couldn't be part of the band anymore, Stanley and I decided to turn it into an, an electric sound, and we went auditioning guitarists. And the first one we found was Billy Connors, really, who who played on um, on Hymn of the Seventh Galaxy. And uh, then uh, there were there were other guitarists too. And then Al Di Miola came on, and we did many recordings together. So that was the main iteration of the band that lasted a couple of years. And we were on the road all the time, man. I mean, we were just, we hardly ever came home. It was very intense. And then, then after that quartet, Stanley and I formed a function called Music Magic. And it was a big band with the brass and uh, uh, with, with brass and saxophones. And we did a couple of tours with that band. But that, that was the uh, return to forever period that was, uh, uh, very memorable. Yeah, incredibly memorable. And, and still, you know, um, to this day, you know, more and more people keep, keep discovering those, those records and, and, you know, falling in love with them, really. But um, you mentioned that you had a, in, a, a hectic touring schedule, you know, or like how, how many gigs a year are we talking at, around this stage? Well, I remember a couple of numbers because we, we weren't even keeping statistics of that sort at that time, but I, I remember looking at it one time, I thought, huh, when, whenever home, I wonder how many gigs we did last year. I think we probably, there was a, a couple of years where we may have done 
up to 220, 250 gigs in wow. a year. That, that's like, because we were on the road at least 10 months of the year uh, and, and, and home very little. So there, were, there was a really, the home base was just like check in, take a breather, write some new music, write a new album and then go out, record it and play again. Uh, it was a very product, productive period. Uh, uh, for that band, but but you know, uh, ju just to to give a present time view that that there was Circle, and then there was re three iterations of Return to Forever, and then there was a period of several years where I didn't have a any one steady band, and I put together many different projects. But starting in 1983, my desire to have a band similar to Return to Forever with with uh, electric guitar and, and uh, using, using all kind of different kind of rhythms, rock rhythms, jazz rhythms, every kind of uh, Latin rhythms. Uh, my answer to that was to put together the electric band in 1983. And uh, we're still going now. In fact, we're, we've got two tours planned for next year and, uh, uh, and a brand new live uh, three LP uh, album that we're producing on our own. Wow. And and so so when are you due to go back on the road again then next year? Well, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how it looks from your end, but right now it seems like uh, in the music world, even though we're doing a lot of online stuff and zooming and so forth, uh, the the venue owners and the promoters and the, uh, are beginning to and and the restrictions are beginning to loosen up. So I, I, my own hope is that, that by in, in a month, two months, whatever, but we have gigs booked now starting next February. And nec from next February on, my year is pretty well filled up. Wow, that's, that's great to hear. I'm sure a lot of people will be, will be very uh, happy to see musicians um, like yourself, you know, returning to, to doing what they do best and being able to see them live. It's, it's really important. Um, yeah, we're looking forward. We're all looking forward to getting out on the road and playing again. And and so, in about a week's time, you're you're doing a live streamed concert, aren't you, on October the tenth? Yeah. Will this be your first live streamed concert? Yeah, I mean, in a way that we're presenting it as a concert, you know, like a one-time live concert, you know, uh, paid tickets like it, like as if uh, it was a theater, uh, and and I'm gonna. I'm going to try to uh, recreate uh, a new version of my piano solo show. Uh, I'm, I'm going to even uh, work at, uh, there's, there's one thing I was doing in my piano solo shows for the past years that was uh, two things really that were a lot of fun. W one, one was uh, inviting people up from the audience to, uh, uh, for me to improvise musical portraits of them. So this will be part of my show, which is there's going to be certain people who send in their uh, uh, requests uh, that that I'll bring them up online and be able to say hello to them and have the whole audience observe, and then I'll I'll imp I'll I'll improvise a um, uh, a portrait of of them, and I'm going to do that a little bit of that online. Unfortunately, I can't do piano duets. Uh, which which I've been doing live in my piano solo show. I invite anyone in the audience to come up and play with me at the piano. Wow. Uh, and uh, but in the, on the live show, it'll just be the portraits and uh, and the uh, we got some other surprises too. We're trying to some film things which we're trying to put together, but mainly piano solo. So I mean, as as we were just saying, you know, it, it's it's quite easy to uh, to move through uh, the passage of time. Um, rather slow, slowly, given the amount, you know, the extreme prolific nature of your career. So I just want to highlight a few different things. Um, first of all, you were mentioning um, dueling pianos. And um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, your work with Herbie Hancock and, and, and you know, how, how much you enjoyed collaborating with him and, and you know what his music means to you, and how much how much how much you enjoy enjoyed um, those experiences with him. Um, when did you first meet Herbie Hancock? Well, Her Herbie Herbie is uh, I think he's about one year older than me. We're about the sick from the same era, you know. But he was on the scene a little bit before me. He was in Miles's band 
before me. He was the pianist before me and Miles' band. And, and funnily enough, back in, that was in 1968, but back in 1960, uh, he, was, he was the pianist that followed me uh, into Mongo Santa Maria's band. And that's where Herbie first recorded uh, Watermelon Man, his famous Watermelon Man was in Mongo Santa Maria's band. So I've, I've known Herbie since the early 60s, uh, but only more, more as a fan and a, and a kind of a student of his. Like I came to New York and he was already on the scene and playing amazingly. And so uh, he inspired me a lot. So when we finally got together uh, on two pianos, uh, uh, that wasn't until the, um, I don't remember the 70s sometime, but, but when we finally got together on two pianos, that was a revelation to both of us, that to, to be able to play freely on two pianos. I mean, it's one thing to play a written music on any instruments. You write it, you write and arrange the music and, and it comes out a certain way. But to improvise together on two grand pianos, both of which have 88 keys, and a lot of sonic possibility, <laughs> and a lot of possibility to 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 slam into each other, right? Uh, we discovered a rapport that allowed anything that he did or anything that I did to be gratefully and creatively accepted and used by the other. So we found this breakthrough point at our first kind of sit down together, where at first we were kind of uh, kind of uh, um, re a little cautious, you know, don't want to get in his way and he didn't want to get in my way. And it was kind of a little, there was a little timidity going on there in terms of thinking, being polite, I guess, I guess. So then at one point we went, hey, what are we being polite? Let's just, you know, I'm, I'm, whatever you play, I'm trying to make it sound good and vice versa. So we just kind of opened up the stops almost instantly and discovered that, that, that everything seemed to work. Everything that we did seemed to work improvisation wise and it was glorious feeling. So, so we did several tours together and we created a wonderful duet that I cherish. Yeah, I think, I think a, lot, a lot of fans cherish those moments and uh, it's great to see two, two masters uh, of, of the craft kind of collaborating like that and, and you know, not without kind of treading on on each other's toes um, because it's obviously a, a difficult thing um, when you're playing the same instrument um, and, and improvising together. Um, it's it's uh, it's very easy to just get stuck in chronological uh, questions here, so I'm just trying to break out of that a little bit. Um, one one of my favourite um, albums of yours is um, from the late '80s, "Eye of the Beholder." Um, is is that one of is, is that an album that that you remember um, fondly? Yeah, absolutely. Eye of the Beholder is one of the eight uh, recordings that the electric band has under its belt right now. And that band uh, uh, became, in 1983, 84, that band became and continues to be up in present time and into the future like a, a family. We become a family and we become a little orchestra. And I'm, I'm kind of the main composer and arranger. Of, of, but but everybody everybody in the band uh, uh, has a very strong uh, uh, I, uh, identity and personal personal sound in the band, which was goal my goal and the goal of all of us. And I have the Beholder was uh, uh, was one in a series of just it was similar to Return to Forever in that once we started touring and making recordings, we just continued to do it because the band was picking up uh, an audience base and fans and we were loving it and the audiences were loving it and we were loving touring and recording. We just kept doing it, you know. Um, I, I, the Beholder had uh, um, that particular, one thing I remember about I, of the Beholder is there were two songs on I, of the Beholder which were maybe in my whole life there might have been only three or four, maybe five times that I have dreamt, dreamt a song, woke up with the song that I just dreamt, gone downstairs, 
uh, wherever my piano was and wrote it out. And, and uh, on Eye of the Beholder, two of the songs were dreams. Uh, the, the, the title song, Eye of the Beholder, was a dream. And, but even before that, the main dream was the song called Eternal Child. It became piecemeal. I mean, it became one whole piece. And I, I woke up with it. And uh, uh, you know, you know how you, uh, you know how when you think of something that's very pleasurable and very deep somehow, and you're not quite sure why, and you start to tear, you start to cry about it. It's it's a it's like a perception of some kind of beauty that you go or a truth or something. You do it in movies sometimes at that at that moment where where a big portion of you know uh the 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 good wins out and you see the good can win or something like that you know and that's the, the effect that this song was creating so i i jumped out of bed and i i, I said to gail I'm, I'm going down i need to write this down because i was singing it to her and as i was singing it i was crying so i went downstairs and and um just spent uh 20 minutes or a half hour or whatever and and, and jotted it down and it came out in one flow. That's what I remember about that record. And, th and then a couple of nights later, this second song, Eye of the Beholder, uh, appeared uh, the same way. That's, a, that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, you do, you do hear about um, with, with uh, great composers and songwriters that, that things can come to them in, in, in their sleep. And I, I always find it fascinating. Um, and another another one of uh, your projects um, that I'm particularly fond of, and I think a, a lot of fans are, um, was you know in the late '90s when you, when you made a, a a record remembering Bud Powell, um, and um, you know what kind of prompted you to um, to do that, and and um, you know how did you select the the musicians who were involved with you for the project? Well, you know I was thinking about that. <clears throat> just uh, uh just the other night because uh uh three three of my main musical composing composer and pianist influences in jazz were bud powell thelonious monk and bill evans and and uh on on each one of those uh uh amazing musicians i did a special project Early on, I did a special recording of all Thelonious Monk's music with Roy Haynes and Miroslav Vitos with my Now He Sings, Now He Sobs trio. And then, uh, and then uh, the, the remembering, uh, uh, oh, and then the Remembering Bud Powell record came, came next. Well, the first musician I invited, and I thought, well, if I could, if Roy Haynes would agree to do this project with me, I'm sure the other guys are going to dive in because Roy, Roy Haynes, he, Roy's now in his, his mid nineties, been a mentor to me and a, and a friend my, my whole life. And, um, but Roy played with all the greats, Charlie Parker, John Coltrane, uh, Thelonious Monk. He's just, the list goes, goes on and on. And, and Roy made some recordings and played with Bud Powell. So I thought if I'm going to make a tribute to my hero, Bud Powell, if I had got Roy on drums, man, the cats are going to come and come and jump in. And that's exactly what happened. Roy said he'd love to do it. And so then I, 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 uh, I invited uh, Kenny Garrett on, on alto, Joshua Redman on uh, tenor, and, and our dear friend Wallace, who passed away recently. Uh, I'm so sorry to lose him on, on trumpet my uh my favorite young trumpet player and and um uh christian mcbride on the bass so that was that was the group that came together and uh my my engineer friend bernie kirsch recorded it at our uh, mad hatter studios in in uh, la and we did several tours with that band and uh we took the band to japan we we played that band we played with uh, the uh, a japanese symphony orchestra uh, we did a lot of great stuff uh, with that band, and it was uh, the, the, it all centered around the the incredible 
spiritual and musical influence of uh, Bud Powell? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was a wonderful recording, I thought, and uh, I mean, it's difficult to choose to choose um, just a few things to highlight. And I would recommend to my listeners, you know, to to at the very least check out the things that I'm highlighting as a, as an intro uh, to your music if if they haven't you know heard it yet, um, which of course many of my listeners will will have. Um, so one of the, one of your more recent uh, albums that was. Um, really great only only came out three years ago was was the musician and um, but also was it really the case that um you know chinese butterfly the, the collaboration with steve gadd was that also in the same year the musician was more that rec recording was more of uh my memory of that was the live experience because i think we did uh uh 1975 i well, no, I, I, it was my 75th birthday, was it? Yeah, yeah, it was the 75th birthday. Well, then that, that, was, uh, that was an eight-week, no, no, that was a six-week engagement at the Blue Note, like, like, uh, you played with like 20, was it, how many different bands did you play with? Was it, was I don't it, remember, but it was like a different band every two days, uh, and uh, it was a glorious experience. I was kind of floating on a wave because all of my friends, came to join me and it was it was put together as a birthday party really to just jam but then i found myself uh being like wow i've got to be the librarian on this what set are we going to do and um and i had to refresh everybody's memory about what uh, i had to put all these different sets together uh, uh that was that was quite an experience uh we did it again uh 75th birthday or was that my 70th birthday? Because the last one we did was for eight weeks. So I don't, I don't recall which one, but then, then that, the, the uh, Chinese butterfly was, I think a little bit after that, wasn't it? Or was the, maybe released the same year? Yeah, I was, but it was, uh, it was after that in terms of when you, when you recorded it. Yeah. Um, but, but I, you know, I remember both of the albums actually coming out, you know, the kind of compilation um, that was entitled The Musician um coming out in the same year as the steve as steve gadd collaboration which um, yeah you know it's it it's it's remarkable um what what a kind of you know productive schedule that you that you maintain and and um it's um yeah really the uh, the basis of my next question which is how do you stay so so inspired <laughs> and creative you know like because uh, uh, do you do you ever find yourself um thinking I don't feel like music today. Or would that no, just no. Fortunately, for, fortunately not. I mean, uh, my my relaxation, like for instance, during the during this lockdown period, I've I've been forced to uh, to see which ways I can keep creativity going without going on the road, which is which is basically where my music lives, is on the road. So uh, so my pleasures have been practicing the piano writing new music uh and coming up with all kind of new projects which uh which, which is I'm, I'm continually doing and will be showing up uh next year but but uh uh i've always just um i've always just since i was very young i've always found it successful to go down the path that like like pursue what my interest was whatever i whatever i i was studying or got interested in i wanted to accomplish i would just do that and and uh i think and then later on when i started sensing my audience more and more i could see that the audience that i played to that spiritually what one of the main factors that they respond to is to see see my interest in what I'm doing, is to see my passion in what I'm doing. That inspires them. I mean, no matter what the form of music is, if I'm if I'm totally there with it and and really delivering this up as as this is what I'm I'm loving doing, that that aspect of uh, 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 it, being part of the performance is um, uh, is something that really always works. It always feels good. 
So that's what I've always done. And I've, I've just kept, uh, uh, you know, I, ha I hate to say it sometimes because it, it tends to be politically incorrect uh, to say, but I just have fun making music, see. Uh, I, 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 it doesn't matter what, like I've, I've done so many collaborations during this period that have no monetary um, thought at all, just, just for the fun of making music. And, and that's how I usually make my new music is I sit down and I'm having fun uh, uh, experimenting. Like for instance, um, I wanted to write for an orchestra and, uh, and I started experimenting. Uh, I wrote a piano concerto many years ago. And uh, just because I love to do that, uh, I got an in, I think I got an invitation from the principal trombonist of the New York Philharmonic, uh, Joe Alessi, who's an amazing trombonist. And, and I met him recently and he invited me to, uh, he and the New York Philharmonic invited me to write a concerto, a trombone concerto for he, him and the orchestra, which I accepted and it's now a finished product and it's gonna premiere in, uh, at Geffen Hall sometime next year, I think uh, toward the summer. Uh, and uh, that's just something I had fun doing. Wow, that, that's gonna that's gonna be great. Um, yeah, another another reason to hope that uh, and you know to to stay positive on the reopening of uh, of live venues. Well, Chick, I really appreciate you taking the time to to do this podcast. I've got a final question for you, um, which is many of your compositions are considered to be standards. Um, are there any compositions of yours that you're particularly proud of? You know, that, that, that keeps changing. I'm, I'm usually, uh, I usually get highly interested in the work that I'm currently doing because I listen to it and I review it and I'm, and I'm placing it and arranging it and so forth. And, and uh, uh, I'm, uh, my, the current piece is, uh, that I'm writing is... Uh, 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 I'm putting together a new, as I said, a new live three, three LP set of a uh, live electric band uh, from Catalina's Jazz Club from some years ago. And uh, I'm, I'm introducing one new composition for the electric band, uh, which I call The Future Is Now, which is going to be the, probably the title of our three, uh, of our set. And so I've been so into this composition and arranging it for, for the quintet that, uh, you know, I go, to, I go to sleep singing it in my head and I wake up and I think of different ways to arrange it and it's, it's been part of me for a week now. So that's kind of how it runs, like whatever I'm, whatever, I'm, uh, uh, whatever I'm into seems to be what's in the forefront of my mind. The, the older songs, uh, I don't remember them until someone reminds me. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I think that I think that's a uh, I think that's a very good trait, you know, to uh, to, to always be looking um, always be looking forward, and to to never be looking back, and to to always be kind of more interested in the next thing that you're doing. It's it's hugely inspiring. I mean, I think you know things like Spain or Five Hundred Miles High or Windows or La Fiesta or, or you know wh whatever it is that that pe people have been um, drawn to your music by. Um, it could be completely different uh, tracks. It could be far more obscure things. It could be albums, uh, live albums from any decade. Um, but uh, I think, you know, the overriding um, point here um, is the one that you made, that, that it's always the next thing that excites you. And, uh, and hopefully that will be something to keep people inspired during uh, this rather strange time. But yeah, thank you so much. That's, well, that's what, that, just one more, more thing. That's why I called the new record The Future Is Now. Yeah, it's a very Cause good title. Because now, now, now is when we, now is always when, when the future gets decided. You, 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 every decision you make, you do now. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And that's uh, what keeps life rolling along. <laughs>